Hello, I'm B.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with award-winning longtime journalist and old friend from the days of the New Mexico Independent Century Magazine, Sherry Robinson, who has authored a fascinating history of uh, the Lapan Apache in a book entitled I Fought a Good Fight. Uh, Sherry also covered the state legislature for the Gallup Independent this year, and we'll talk a little bit about rural issues in New Mexico if we can, uh, if we can at the end of the program. Um, if you're interested in the way the world really is, and if you think indigenous frontier history in the West is a vital part of that reality, I Fought a Good Fight is a book you won't be able to put down. Cherry is a marvelous storyteller. And this is a marvelous, even a classic story to be told. It's just wonderful to have you here today, and I can't wait to get into this with you. Great, and thank you for inviting me. So as we read your book, we realize that, that uh, the Lapans were, were everywhere. They were powerful. They were influential. They, they interacted with almost all, all the major tribes in our region. Uh, but I'd certainly never heard that much about them, if at all. I mean, I you know, heard a little bit because I'm a student in anthropology, but just a tiny bit. And so this was a whole revelation to me. So could you tell our readers a little bit about who they were and where they were and, and, uh, and what, their, what their general relationships were with the, other, with the other tribes in this area? I stumbled over uh, the Lapans as I was doing the research for... This is my second book, which was Apache Voices. Oh, okay. And that was about the more familiar people, Geronimo's people, Victorio's people, the, and, and also the Mescaleros. And I would see a mention every now and then of Lapans, and my response was, well, I pretty familiar with Apaches, but I've never heard of these people. Who yeah. are they? And that set me off on a, on a whole new project. Um, I started looking for information about them, and I figured it would be small group, small project, small book. <laughs> <laughs> Take me a couple of years at the outside. Wrong. Um, uh, it was. It turned into. It turned into an amazing journey. Um, I I pursued this just because it was it was something uh, that that nobody knew about. Um, and then it and then it turned out it turned out that they were they were far bigger and more influential than I thought. I also discovered an entire confederacy that that nobody seems to know about either. And so um, you know what I what I tell people when I'm speaking about this is that uh, is that the first surprise is how many of them there were. Um, the Eastern Apaches. There were thousands of them really? across across the eastern plains. There were thousands, and the more familiar groups uh, that that we see all the time uh, were never more than a few hundred um, at a time. And you know they were very small groups, but the eastern Apaches were a big, big group, and the, the Lapans at one time were uh, numbered five thousand people. No kidding. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, then that was that was just what anybody knew about, and so um, so they were big, they were influential, they interacted uh, with a lot of other tribes, and what usually happens is that historians and I had this I had this experience where I'd go to a meeting of the Western History Association, which is all academics. And I'm a lowly journalist, of course. Um, <laughs> I'm, they're slumming by letting me in. But anyway, so I'd go to these meetings, and, and they'd say, and what are you working on? And I would say, Lapan Apaches. And some learned professor would say, oh, well, they're extinct, you know. And, <laughs> and at this point, I was already interviewing um, descendants, Lapan descendants at Mescalero, so I knew they were not extinct. And it wasn't long before I discovered the people in Texas who have organized and reorganized in two different groups and have applied for recognition from the federal government. And, and it was interesting because I'm, 
as a as a historian, I find all of this interesting. Um, I I find what I you know what I what I have found in the military records is fascinating, and and any any factoid to me is fascinating. But it took on a whole new life when I discovered the modern surviving Lapan descendants because uh, I realized in, in speaking to them that they have been deprived of their history. And they've been deprived in a couple of ways, not only by the learned professors saying, oh, well, they're extinct, but just by um, bad history. Hmm. This bad history told a number of times. So when I went back and began to dig, um, that's when I discovered. That's when I discovered that um, where they were and how many there were and what kind of people they were and how resourceful they were. Um, Apaches are are interesting because they're intelligent, they're adaptable, um, they're resilient, and and they're absolutely fearless. They're just fearless, and for most of the time. Um, they were outnumbered, yeah. you know, and they were certainly outnumbered by the Comanches, um, and so that part of it, you know, just the the story, the story of them is interesting. But then the story of them now is also interesting. And one of the one of the first phone calls I got was from a man at Mescalero saying. Uh, we're Lapan, and my boy wants to know what it means to be a Lapan. Wow. And I said, I can't tell you that yet because I'm still in the early part of my research, um, but I'll get back to you. And, <laughs> and so I, was, I thought about that a lot, that there are people out there who really don't know, you know, who really, who really don't know who they are or where they where they came from they have their family stories but they don't have much else and not only that but the family stories even have been suppressed um, sure. a lot of them um, you know after the Indian Wars a lot of Lapans were so afraid that they would be forced onto a reservation or just murdered outright that their parents told them not to speak Apache, oh, not dear, to use yeah, their yeah. Apache names. Yeah. Um, they, would, uh, they would punish them for speaking Apache because if the authorities heard that, um, it, it could be, you know, it could be really harmful to them. And so most of us, most of us have some idea of who we are and who, what our roots are, you know, and yeah. we can say, well, I'm English and Irish or I'm, I'm Italian, I'm this, I'm Jewish, I'm whatever, and, and have an idea of what that means because either we're surrounded with it or our parents have told us. But if, if you're somebody and you have passed as Hispanic all these years, but under the table there are stories about, about an Indian heritage that you're not supposed to talk about, mm -hmm. That's you know that's confusing and it's sad because they're deprived of, you know they're deprived of this amazing history. So, um, so after I started to talk to um, Lapan people, then then the then it became more than just another fact gathering uh, project. So what got you interested in in what has to be. Uh, to a degree, ethnographic history, uh, particularly of Apaches. I mean, I, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have imagined it. Uh, but these are wonderful books. The um, I'd love you to sort of, sort of reflect on them a little bit. But I'd also like you to sort of, uh, if you could situate uh, uh, the major historical events in, in this recent book, uh, and put some, some. T time frame to it if we could. I got interested in Apaches just by happenstance um, in the 1990s. Um, my husband was an archaeologist and I tagged along on a field trip mm -hmm. to see Apache sites in southwestern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And in the process, um, the tour leader 
who was a, an El Paso attorney by the name of Tom Diamond, uh, introduced me to Eve Ball's books. Um, Eve oh. Ball lived it, it, uh, outside of Ruidoso and wrote two books about Apaches, and I started reading her books. Um, and that, that, got me, that got me interested in Apaches. Um, I was predisposed to be interested in, in Native Americans because growing up I had a retired uh, teacher living next door who was interested in Native Americans, and she used to give me things. She gave me a bead loom and books and things like that, and so because she was interested, and, and um, so that, that started, started a kind of a lifelong curiosity, and then I lived on the Navajo Reservation in the 1970s, and lived and worked, did newspaper work um, in, in um, uh, from the reservation and in western New Mexico for a few years, and you work for newspapers over there, you, you write about the tribes, sure. um, and, and so, yeah, it's just, it's just kind of been with me for a very long time. I've always been interested in them. And um, the uh, Apaches in particular have not been written about as much as the Pueblos and Navajos. I mean, the Pueblos have dozens and dozens of books written about them. Yeah. Navajos, probably as many. And uh, the Apaches, for some reason, are not, not quite as explored, so... Yeah. That, that made it more interesting to me. Um, let's see, and you'd asked about the, um, the timeline. Um, let's see, let me, let me sketch out a kind of a Cliff's Notes history <laughs> <laughs> for you. Um, um, the, as far as we know, um, the, the Lepans started out in northeastern New Mexico. They lived... Uh, from the Sangre de Cristos out into the plains along the Canadian River. Oh. And they lived a long way out onto the plains along the Canadian. Uh, French explorers found them as far as present-day Oklahoma. So they were kind of stretched out along there. Um, the rest of the Confederacy, there were bands from southern the, Nebraska... This is the Apache Confederacy. Right. Yeah. yeah, the Eastern Apache Confederacy stretched from probably southern Nebraska down into the Texas Panhandle, uh, into northeastern New Mexico, southern Colorado, um, wow. possibly possibly north, north of that. Now, Apaches are, are always... Um, challenging for archaeologists because they didn't leave much behind. There is no big Pueblo out there that's an Apache Pueblo. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so they have learned to identify fire rings and they've gotten more clever in recent years. There's a lady named Denny Seymour who's an archaeologist and I think she's probably ahead of the game in identifying Apache sites. She's learned to find their sites by where they would camp. And so she's done a lot of, a lot of writing about the, the, eastern, uh, the eastern Apaches. But anyway, after the Pueblo Revolt, the Lapans moved into Texas. They now had horses. Um, and so they they used they used the horses to move into Texas around the area of present day San Antonio and all the way across Texas to the Gulf, and and they stayed there. They stayed there for two hundred years. Um, they lived they lived all over Texas. Um, in the um, Let's see, sometime in the 1700s, probably after 1750, they divided into upper and lower groups. So the lower group was still on the Gulf. The upper group uh, was, was along the lower Rio, or the upper Rio Grande, the lower Pecos, and the Staked Plains. Right. Um, and so that's uh, that's where they were. And the upper Lapans mixed with uh, Mescaleros. The Mescaleros were their close friends and allies. Okay. 
And so that's why eventually um, when the buffalo were gone, when they had nowhere else to turn, they ended up on the Mescalero Reservation. So the Lapans are really intimately woven into, into the history of eastern New Mexico, which I, which I really didn't have any idea of, and, and of course Texas. And, and, uh, the, um, but what really got me about the book uh, was the, the picture that you painted of, um, of, their, of their resiliency and their toughness and, uh, and how, they, um, how they managed to work alliances and to work agreements and to have tr uh, trade networks with people on how they managed to keep the Comanche at bay and even defeat them from time to time. And there was nothing of, of a sense of, of, uh, of uh, sort of hapless victimization. I mean, these were powerful people. They lost some things, uh, they eventually lost the war, uh, but they were in it right up to the end. And they had a kind of character about them that I had never even thought of, really, because I'd never read about them before, obviously. <laughs> so could you talk a little bit more about that quality? I mean, what was their inner character that made them so powerful? There was a, there was a kind of resilience to them that made them unstoppable. Uh, whenever there was an obstacle, they would find a way around it. Um, so it was like um, the Spanish didn't want to uh, didn't want to sell them guns. So it was like, well, okay, we'll find someplace else to buy guns. And about that time, there were French traders on the plains, um, and so they learned to trade from French traders, and also. They befriended these little, these little tiny tribes in East Texas and Louisiana who traded with the French. Uh -huh. And so they would trade their horses and mules and buffalo products with these, with these little tribes who would then provide them with guns. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and this, this just went on. They, they were, um, and of course, in... In my uh, other life, my day job, I'm still a business writer, and so to me, one of the really interesting things about this was watching how they did business, and and they were um, they were devoted traders. Oh. Um, you know, people tend to think of Apache as raid as raiding people, and they were raiding people, but they also um, when when there were mustangs. All over, um, all over Central Texas, they would tame these mustangs that no one else would bother with, and then bring them in and sell them. They hunted buffalo. They brought in, uh, they brought in skins. Um, they had, uh, they had networks everywhere, and they were willing to make friends with all kinds of people, even their enemies. Um, <laughs> and you know, sometimes they would, they would. Um, Make they would make efforts to ally with somebody who had who had been an enemy, um, and they they had done this all along, and so so they had they had quite a big uh, they had quite a big network of of friends in all kinds of places, mm -hmm. and that was their initial relationship with the Americans too. When Americans started to pour into Texas, when Texas was still um, a part of, um, well, first Spain and then Mexico, uh, they considered the Americans someone, someone new to make an alliance with. Huh. Boy, look at these people with their long guns. Yeah. Look at those guns. We've never seen guns like that before. And they were very quick to pick up a new, a new technology. Um, one of the most interesting things I read was... Um, a report of somebody who who encountered who encountered people, and I think it was a surveying party, and um, they described a Lapan looking at a compass for the first time. They showed him a compass, and he explained to them in in very good Spanish how that compass worked. Um, you know, it, it just took them, it took them no time at all to master a new technology, and they were, they were very quick to, to embrace whatever it was that 
that somebody had. Um, and, and so that, that made a lot of difference. And, and they were just, um, they were just nervy. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I would read these accounts of things that, w that had happened and how they got out of it. And, and I would just have to laugh out loud, um, you know, like, I don't believe you just did that. But, um, yeah, they were, they were amazing in that way. Would you tell us one of those stories? Oh, for example, uh, there was a point in time when uh, the Spanish, the Spanish were were about to send out an expedition against against the Apaches, and they told the Lapans that, oh, this isn't this isn't you. We're after we're after the Mescaleros. We're after the other groups, and so the chief said. Um, okay, I'm going to leave behind these two men to scout for you. And, um, and which he did, and he said, he said, we're going off to hunt buffalo. And so they left. Um, the expedition went forth with these, with these two Lapan scouts. They went the entire expedition without seeing any Apaches at all, including the so-called buffalo hunters. And then not until they got back did the captain of the expedition decide they were forewarned. <laughs> so. so then they were steering them away. One of the things that, that really fascinated me about this book was um, as a as an anthropology student long ago, um, uh, I started reading uh, autobiographies of, of the Native Americans, which was a, a popular ethnographic tool, I guess in the 30s and 40s. Um, and uh, what that did was, is it sort of took the, the caricature quality of, of what most of us know about the West and about cowboys and Indians and all that stuff, just completely obliterated. I mean, here we're suddenly deeply complicated, uh, completely unpredictable human beings with rich histories and pasts and mistakes and triumphs and everything, just like everybody else on the planet. And so here I am, you know, I too had this image in my head of Apaches, you know, I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a cowboy and Indian guy myself from California. What did I know, you know, and suddenly, but suddenly here is this whole world with all of these people and all of these leaders and all of this, these ups and downs and travails and prevailings and defeats and this but, as you said, this quality of them being guerrilla fighters, guerrilla traders, and uh, guerrilla hunters, and simply having this enormous, I guess you'd have to call it, cultural, national resiliency that, that allowed them to to survive for a very long time against really terrible odds on all sides. Um, could you sort of reflect on that a little bit more? Because I think it's really the, the core of the whole book. I mean, it's so interesting. <laughs> there was there was within them, um, by disposition or maybe by culture, a drive to survive, mm. and. The Apaches, all of them, all of them, were known to make sacrifices um, of, a, you know, to sacrifice a few people so that the band could survive, and so, uh, so this this was part of it. This this um, uh, this kind of this kind of underlying um, this underlying passion for survival, and and also I think they. I think they didn't take defeat as defeat as in it's all over. Mm. It's um, well, you know, we're we're down for now, but we're we're gonna we're gonna go off to a safe place and recover, and our warriors are going to um, uh, are are going to heal from their wounds, and we're going to. Um, hunt and gather food, and so they would. They would just kind of retreat for a while, um, recover, and often they retreated to another group, which was what was handy about the um, 
the Confederacy, um, because even though the Confederacy was huge early on, um, over time, both disease and war had reduced their numbers mm -hmm. and had reduced the bands. But still, they could go. Um, they could go and find uh, find a Mescalero camp, or find a Yanero camp, or you know find find someone to go stay with for a while while mm -hmm. they uh, while they nursed their wounds, and so. The, the thing about them is that they came back. They just always came back. They came back again and again and again. And when, um, I don't know how many captains of three countries would be sure that they had wiped them out, and, and then lo and behold, in another few years, there was another captain complaining about, about these Apaches. <laughs> and so, yeah, there, I think there was no no concept of a of a permanent defeat and even even when they had to go to the reservation in the end it was still a way to survive yeah um they weren't they weren't happy about it but you know but it it meant they could survive so i get the feeling that on the reservations on on the other apache reservations that the, the lapans sort of submerged their tribal identity somehow and then, and then, sort of let everybody believe that they were gone, or had been, or or had been defeated, or wiped out, or something like that. And then you suddenly discover that there are living descendants, and and then indeed they haven't been extinct, if, if you will. Uh, is that how did that work? And what did you do when you started meeting these people? I mean, that must have been a wonderful thing. And how many Lipans are left? Well, the thing about. Um the thing about La Panza and the reservation, or or even um, even growing up um, in Texas off the reservation, is that um, the head count on the reservation was a convenience for the white men, and and so for example, when you know you had a group of of La Panza that went in with the Tonkawas. And so the white agent just counted them all as Tonkawas, but the Lapans still knew they were Lapans. Ah. The Tonkawas still knew they were Lapans, but they would show up in the records as Tonkawas. Mm. And to this day, there are people, I haven't met them, but I've heard about them. There are, are people on, in uh, Tonkawa country who know they're Lapans, and they come to Mescalero to visit relatives. Uh, they show up in the summer for the for the girls' puberty ceremony. So mm -hmm. so the ties, the ties are still there. And the same at Mescalero, um, half the time the the agents, the agents weren't terribly competent in the first place. They were not always honest. Um, for their own convenience, they just kind of assumed everybody was a Mescalero, but they didn't know for sure, especially when they were all first coming in. They didn't know who was there. Yeah. And so um, there's, uh, um, I spend a lot of time wading through census records, and the early census records, sometimes the agent... Um, and I'm always thankful to them when I find it. The agent would jot a little note next to a name, or they'd, mm. or they'd put Lapan in parentheses, or something like that. And and over time, I was, I was able to piece together the Lapan names um, so that I could pick them out. But but even then, but they they all know who they are. And of the, the ladies I interviewed at um, <clears throat> at Mescalero. Um, they not only they not only spoke Lapan, they spoke Apache and the Lapan dialect, oh, and man. and this is twenty years after the most prominent linguist said uh, that the Lapan language was dead. God, how wonderful! They were not only speaking; they were singing. They they had a birthday party for for Lucy Evelyn Smith. And um, and sang songs. They sang Lapan songs for her. And so uh, the elders at Mescalero, they know exactly who they are. The young people tend to say, "Well, I'm Mescalero." They they don't distinguish so much, but the elders all know all know what their background is. So they're alive and well. And then in Texas, there was. Um, 
it was kind of a movement that grew along with um, grew along with other movements about oh maybe 20 years ago um, you know as different as different groups started to come forward red power black power that kind of thing and it, it grew out of that and these people had been had hid their had hidden their heritage for such a long time, and then all of a sudden um, it was the younger people, um, kind of rediscovering who they were. And another guy who called me, um, who's a he's a wonderful artist named Aikashai Montoya, who lives in California, and he told me on the phone that that he's a born again Indian. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah, and and so you have a lot of these people who, in adulthood, um, want to know what it means. You know, again, going back to this this young man, what does it mean to be Le Pen? They are as as adults learning yeah. what does it mean to be Le Pen. So you know, I think about twelve twelve years of research, and I know. I know for journalists, uh, you know, like us, you know, who write, we don't write long, <laughs> oftentimes, and so it's pretty tough. I mean, I know it is. Uh, I spent seven years on one too, but I'm really interested in your sources, in in the in where you went to get this information, P particularly if a learned professor said they're extinct and was completely uninterested in them. Where did you go? I visited um, over over a dozen libraries and archives uh, over a 12-year period um, in five states. Um, I don't read Spanish, and so I found a wonderful lady in Belen um, who could translate for me. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I, spend, I spend a lot of time going back and forth to Texas, um, to the archives, and uh, and just kind of finding stuff wherever I, wherever I could, and and it's, you know, it's almost like pulling a loose thread from a sweater. Um, the threads would just lead in all directions, and so that's one of the reasons it 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 took so long. Um, and then the National Archives, um, I. Uh, I made use of two things. I did visit the National Archives in Washington, D.C., which is, uh, that's incredible. It's like the the source of all knowledge, but, um, you know, to, to sit to sit in those old archives. But anyway, um, I, I love that. But also, I made a lot of use of the, of the Mormon Family Center, and they have, oh. they have their own, um, um, <clears throat> they have their own resources there. They have they have copies of all of this stuff that's in the National Archives. Only only they have it there in a different numbering system, uh -huh. and so and they were wonderful. The volunteers the volunteers are terrific. So I sat. You know there were people all around me uh, sleuthing their family histories and talking about well, gee, my grandpa is this and that, and and I was looking for you know, specific Indian people. And, um, and so it was that kind of added to the, that, that kind of added to it. It was fun. God, it sounds like horrible fun. And, you know, and a, a journalist, I think, um, you know, I, I was telling somebody about this once. Um, I think a journalist pursues research a little differently than, than an academic. Um, I was telling somebody that, you know, that it was all bits and pieces, you know, I'm just finding bits and pieces mm -hmm. that I'm having to knit together. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, that's a perfect project for a journalist because we work with bits and pieces and mm -hmm. academics like their research a little tidier. One of the great things about I Fought a Good Fight is the detail, the clothing, the food, the interactions, the deals, the battles, endless quantity of things. I mean, it's really fascinating. I mean, you just, you know, you get in there, and if you're interested in this, you just can't put it down, because every, every part, there's another thing, there's, you know, there's something else you had no idea about, you couldn't, and the relationships between the tribes. So where did all that information come from? I mean, it couldn't have 
couldn't have uh, come from family archives, I don't think. <laughs> well, I'm glad you noticed that because I'm rather proud of that, actually. I I did a lot of, uh, of research that was kind of parallel to the main course. For example, um, when you you know when you're writing when you're writing history it's it's very similar to writing fiction in that you want to set a scene yeah. and so if i'm writing about the canyons of the pecos um i can't write about the canyons of the pecos the way they look now because they don't look the same right. uh the flora and fauna are all different and you know and you've had uh, environmental changes and so forth and and so I would have to hunt up expeditions surveying expeditions and sometimes they would have um, a biologist or a geologist or they would have have a scientist of some kind along describing what he saw and so um, I I did a lot of that I tried to find I tried to find any bit of of description and I used um, I also used priests a lot um, priests wrote regular letters um, to Mexico City or to Spain or you know wherever wherever the uh, hierarchy was and and the priests were actually better at reporting on the people themselves because they would report about you know, the, um, a chief having two wives, or you know, they would they would describe what these people were like, and and sometimes they were describing it in the context of, you know, of look how much I'm suffering, you know, look look at the difficulties I have here, <laughs> but it it was still a way of of uh, uh, for me to find information, and yeah. so they they were a great source. Um, Sometimes the uh, uh, the Spanish governors, and and they differed one from the other, but but the Spaniards, bless them, wrote they wrote reams of reports. They wrote reams of reports to their superiors, and they would and they would describe their encounters with them. Um, and and see their context was also a little different, which is um, you see how you you see you see how difficult these people are, and this is why I need more men and I need more <laughs> arms. But they would describe a whole a whole event that that happened, and so from that you extract the people and the personalities. And I'll tell you when uh, after. After the the um, revolt, when Mexico was in charge, and all of a sudden, uh, all of that wonderful Spanish correspondence disappears. Poof, boy! It's it got really hard to know what was going on because suddenly you didn't have bureaucrats reporting any anymore. Um, and and I really missed I I missed the Spanish bureaucrats when I didn't have them anymore, and so then you have this period of time uh, while Mexico is in charge and the correspondence grows thin, and then the Americans come and then then you have correspondence again, and so um, and then later on there were newspaper accounts. Well, of course, yeah. um, you know there were. There were people like me out there with their pad and pencil um, <laughs> writing things. And, and um, so, yeah, and diaries, a um, lot of, I used oral history whenever I could. Mm. I, I went, I, <laughs> one of the crazier things I did, I flew to uh, Ithaca with swine flu. <laughs> I had I had bought my ticket. I was not going to give up this ticket because it cost me a lot, and um, and I was sick as a dog. And I went to the Cornell archives to um, to look at Morris Opler's okay. work um, with um, with the Mescaleros and the Lapans because he had done these oral histories in the 1930s, and I needed I needed to see that, and so. 
I I was loaded up on meds and I went in their archives and and um, coughed and sneezed and you know probably nobody wanted to be around me but I got my material. God damn it. <laughs> And to write a book, you really have to be a maniac, I've decided. You do. You're totally right. You're totally right. So um, the, uh, the Le Pons were, were um, um, sort of the perennial enemies of, of the Comanches, but they also had trees with them and deals with them, too, I, I expect. And didn't they then get sort of caught up in, in uh, the Texas War of Independence and, and have relationships with... But that government and what happened on that score? The Lapans were were very quick to make friends with the Americans who first came in to uh, Texas um, back when it was back when it was still under Spain, um, and so they they were allies, um, and for a long time they were friends with both Mexico and Texas. Oh. And and this was under Chief Castro, um, who was he? Chief Castro was an was an interesting man. He was a native. He was a natural statesman. It just um, he just had a gift for it, and he thought it would be better to try to get along with everybody. Um, and then after a while, then they they had to make a choice. They had to they had to. Uh, throw their lot in with with uh, one or the other and so they ultimately became allies of the Texans okay. and for a time um, they were they were scouts guides and spies during the war wow. um, after the war Chief Castro had his own unit of the Texas Rangers ha no kidding and wow. and was one of the one of the few Indian people who did, and so this lasted. There was a period of time that that was uh, it was a wonderful time of peace for them, that that they were they really were at peace with everyone. Um, they rode with the Rangers for a long time because they were still at war with the Comanches. Mm -hmm. The Comanches refused to make peace with anybody, and so by riding with the Rangers, it was an excuse to make war with this powerful new ally mm -hmm. against their traditional enemies. Now, over time, this changed because their relationship with the Texans changed. Um, as more Texans or as more Americans poured into Texas, and uh, and went to Indian land to farm, mm -hmm. um, ignoring or or not knowing that they were on Indian land, and and uh, <clears throat> and of course there were a lot of problems, and they signed treaty after treaty, but anyway they were eventually pushed off pushed off their own land. Uh, the Lapans took refuge in Mexico, but um, but for a long time they were they were allied with they were allied with Texas. So could you tell us a little bit more about the statesman uh, uh, Chief Castro and about and about Mrs. Magouche and about uh, Percy Big Mouth, which is one of my favorite names in in all of history. I think Chief Castro. Uh, became he became a chief when he was very young. Um, what year would that be? I think. I think it would have been right around 1820 because he became a chief just before, uh, just before Mexico broke from Spain, okay. and so he uh, he surfaced. Um, there were two chiefs. One was very warlike. One was hostile and warlike. The other one was Castro, who was who went to Mexico City to sign a treaty with the New Mexican government, mm. and um, and and Castro was also a, a quick learner. I mean, he just was he just was a quick study, and he became credible with both the Mexicans and the Americans as someone they could go to. For example, if someone's horse was stolen, they could go to Chief Castro and say, you know, Fred here says his horse is stolen, can, can we get him back? And, and Castro and his sons 
also became knowledgeable about the American about the American system, so that when someone stole their livestock, they would go to the American court and say our livestock was stolen, and so um, he he just learned. Um, he learned how how all of these systems worked. He learned the niceties. He was taken he was taken to uh, a ball one time by uh, uh, by Lamar. Um, uh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, he was taken to a, he was taken to a ball one time, and and there was an observer who noticed that. He complimented all the ladies. He said nice things about the about the heroes of the Texas Re Revolution. I mean, he he just was he just was somebody who who had a, a gift for for all the niceties of another of another culture. Yeah. And and he spoke he spoke well too. And then what was interesting to me is that his sons learned this is his sons learned all of this and they were they were good statesmen and they were also very articulate they spoke uh they all of them spoke beautiful spanish um and and they spoke some and they spoke some english and so i think i think that it was just by the by the gift of Castro that they probably lived at peace longer than they might have mm. and that after Castro died then uh, then the scales tar started to tip and there was no no Castro to run interference wow. um, and then and then things changed dramatically um, the other let's see Percy Big Mouth um, and of course, every, everyone wonders about the name. How would you get a name like that? Um, Percy's father was his name was Big Mouth, and he was a scout, and he was he was very proud of being a scout for for the army. And usually, the names the names happen for reasons that are not obvious mm -hmm. to anybody else. Um, you know, and sometimes, sometimes it might have been it might have been a dream, or it might have been um, something, you know, something that happened during battle, or you know, oh, yeah. people people got these names. And I've never read a good explanation in all of the oral histories. I never saw an explanation of that name. But Percy Big Mouth lived on the Mescalero Reservation. He was half Lapan and and half mescalero um, his father was mescalero and his mother was lapan which made him lapan and and so percy became concerned this was this was along about um 30s the 30s 40s 50s he became concerned that the culture was being lost and and he was also concerned that the young people at Mescaleros weren't interested in in learning. Um, there were a lot of people then at Mescalero who who had great knowledge, including Percy himself, and and so he began to just tell his stories, to share his stories with whoever would listen, including visiting groups of Boy Scouts, and. <laughs> tourists he he was very fond of kids and um and he struck up a correspondence with with several people and so he would send off um i still have copies he would write down the stories on a big chief tablet and and then put them in the mail to all of these people that he had become friends with and two of these collections ended up at BYU, which is where I found him, and so um, uh, after after Apache Voices, then uh, and when I was working on Le Pans, I got a phone call from some people in Tennessee, and the lady had met Percy when she was a girl, no. and she had she had a pile of these Big Chief letters, and they wanted to know if I'd like to see them. Good Lord. And so I was like, would I? Yeah. And and so they sent me copies, um, and I I used them in the book, 
And then they wanted to know uh, what they should do with them, and I persuaded them to put them in the uh, special collections at UNM. Good. And uh, oh, nice. seems like we lose so much of our resource to other states, yes. you know. So I was glad to see this one come back. And then I became really good friends with them. This is Jackson and Jean Harris from Nashville, and I, I have met their whole family. They've been here and. And for a long time, they would go to the reservation every summer and visit Percy's family. And Percy's been gone now for you know for a very long time. But um, I've been amazed at the relationships I've formed in the course of writing this book. It wasn't just it wasn't just research and writing. I got to know so many amazing people. This has been wonderful. I've just enjoyed this so much. You know, to, you know, to actually, to, you know, I mean, I, I'm, um, you know, anybody who writes books admires other people who write books because there are no easy things to do. And to pull, pull something off like, like this, which uh, uh, if you get a chance, do read this book because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a barn burner. It really is. I mean, you, how can it possible? But it is. It's fascinating. Thank you so much, Sherry. And thank you for inviting me. I've I've seen this on the net, and it's so nice to be sitting here in your library. I've enjoyed this too. <laughs>